Welcome to this overview of landmark federal pharmacy legislation. In this video, we're going to look at 13 important pieces of federal legislation from the 1900s to the present day. As we will see, federal legislation is generally limited to regulating the development, manufacture, distribution, and marketing of drugs, while the specifics of pharmacy practice are regulated by individual states. Nevertheless, the federal laws discussed in this video are among those that have had a large role in helping to shape how we practice pharmacy today. Before the Pure Food and Drug Act of 1908, there was no significant legislation regulating the effectiveness, safety, or purity of food and drugs. The Jungle by Upton Sinclair, detailing disturbing and unsanitary conditions in the meatpacking industry, served as the impetus for list legislation in the progressive atmosphere of the 1900s. The Pure Food and Drug Act for the first time prohibited the sale of drugs that were misbranded or adulterated. However, due to the way this law was written, enforcement by the federal government proved to be difficult. The need for a new and stronger law was recognized, yet no new legislation was passed for several decades. In the late 1930s, a tragedy catalyzed the need for new food and drug legislation. A drug manufacturer had formulated a sulfonilamide elixir using diethylene glycol as the vehicle. No safety tests were performed with this preparation. Diethylene glycol proved to be extremely toxic and many children died as a result of taking this preparation. The Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act of 1938 forms the nucleus of our modern federal pharmacy laws. For the first time, all marketed drugs were required to be demonstrated as safe before marketing. It also prohibited both adulteration and misbranding and provided for adequate enforcement of these provisions. The act defined the term drug and created labeling requirements that must accompany each drug package. Finally, the act established the modern Food and Drug Administration to carry out its provisions. This law is still in effect today and has been repeatedly amended over time. Many of the laws discussed in this video are amendments to the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. In the 1950s, lawmakers, including the former pharmacist Hubert Humphrey, who later became vice president, realized the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act required some amendments. Labeling law in the FDCA required that adequate directions for use be placed on every container. However, many drugs could not be adequately labeled for safe use by the average layperson. The Durham-Humphrey Amendment established two categories of drugs, those available over the counter and those available only by prescription. The law further established labeling requirements for each category. For the first time, we had a clear distinction between prescription and over-the-counter medications in the United States. The Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act was amended further in 1962 with the passage of the Kefauver harris Amendment. In the late 1950s, the drug thalidomide had been marketed extensively in Europe as a sedative. As we all know, thalidomide resulted in thousands of birth defects in babies born to mothers who took this drug. Congress responded by passing this amendment, which required that drugs be demonstrated to be effective as well as safe before marketing. This amendment also established good manufacturing practices and enhanced research ethics by requiring informed consent for research subjects. In 1970, the Poison Prevention Packaging Act was enacted. The intent of this legislation was to reduce poisoning from drugs and household substances, mainly in children. The act stipulated that almost all over-the-counter and prescription drugs, as well as other household substances, must use child-resistant packaging. The law provided for patient or physician requests for non-child-resistant closures. It also provides for exceptions to these packaging rules for some drugs, including nitroglycerin tablets, inhalers, topical medications, and other medications sold in compliance packaging, such as steroid dose packs and oral contraceptives. In 1984, Congress passed the Hatch-Waxman Amendment to the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, also known as the Drug Price Competition and Patent Term Restoration Act. This legislation streamlined the generic drug approval process and created the abbreviated New Drug Application, or ANDA. Using this process, generic drugs do not have to demonstrate safety and efficacy as brand name drugs must do. They merely need to demonstrate their quality, 
and bioequivalents to the brand name drug. In turn, this act also ensured extended patent protection terms for innovator drugs in order to encourage future drug development. In the mid-80s, there was a growing concern about a secondary market of diverted prescription drugs, which posed a potential threat to public health. The Prescription Drug Marketing Act, among its many provisions, established restrictions on prescription drug samples and prohibited their sale. It also prohibited the sale of reimported drugs and the resale of drugs by hospitals and other healthcare organizations. Also, for the first time, wholesalers were required to become licensed in each state where they do business. Wisconsin's regulations for licensing of wholesalers can be found in Section 13 of the Pharmacy Examining Board regulations. One piece of federal legislation that had a profound impact on the way pharmacists practice was the Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act of 1990, also known as OBRA 90. Using its oversight of the Medicaid program, the federal government mandated two clinical practices for Medicaid patients that pharmacists now perform universally. The first, Prospective Drug Utilization Review, required pharmacists to review the prescribed drug therapy and the patient's medication profile for drug-related problems before dispensing a drug to a patient. The second is patient counseling. Ober 90 mandated patient counseling for all Medicaid patients. In the years following Ober 90, in order to provide a consistent level of care, most states, including Wisconsin, enacted regulations requiring some form of both of these patient care processes for all patients. Wisconsin's rules for these processes can be found in FAR 7 of the Pharmacy Examining Board regulations. The Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act of 1994 fundamentally changed the way that vitamins, herbals, probiotics, and other complementary and alternative medicines are regulated. This act officially created the category of dietary supplements in which these substances are regulated more like food than like drugs. As a result, FDA premarket approval is not required for these substances, although if safety issues do arise, the FDA has the power to remove them from the market. According to this legislation, labels on dietary supplements can make claims regarding their effect on structure and function of the body, but not claims that their product treats specific diseases. So, the label on a bottle of St. John's wort, for example, can claim that it supports mental health, but not that it treats depression. In 1992, Congress passed the Prescription Drug User Fee Act. This act allowed the FDA to charge fees to manufacturers to support the FDA review of new drug applications. These fees are used for administrative purposes and to hire reviewers for the vast amount of paperwork required in a new drug application. This process helped to accelerate the rate at which new drugs can be approved. This act must be renewed every five years. The FDA Modernization Act of 1997 streamlined and modernized outdated FDA regulations to prepare the agency for the 21st century. This act created a number of fast-track approval processes in order to more quickly approve drugs intended for serious and life-threatening diseases. The act also affirmed pharmacists' ability to compound extemporaneously based on individual prescriptions or on anticipated demand for compounded prescriptions. This act also prompted the FDA to establish a national clinical trial registry and eventually the online resource clinicaltrials.gov that we all know and love. In response to growing methamphetamine abuse in the United States, Congress passed the Combat Methamphetamine Epidemic Act in 2005. This act regulated methamphetamine precursors including the over-counter drugs pseudoephedrine, ephedrine, and phenylpropanolamine. The act restricted quantities of these drugs that could be sold over the counter at one time and also required records of all sales of these drugs. This act also required sellers of these drugs to undergo training and certify with a DEA. These requirements resulted in pharmacies moving all pseudoephedrine products behind the pharmacy counter. Wisconsin created additional legislation related to the use of and sale of pseudoephedrine, 
which may be found in its Controlled Substances Act. In 2013, in response to numerous deaths from contaminated IV solutions dispensed by the New England Compounding Pharmacy, Congress passed the Drug Quality and Security Act. This legislation created a new Section 503B of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act in order to tighten sterile compounding regulations and ensure the quality of these products. In a separate section, this act also required new track and trace processes for all pharmaceuticals in the United States. Currently, three pieces of information must be maintained by pharmacies for all prescription drug packages. Transaction information, transaction history, and a transaction statement. The law also mandates that a nationwide electronic interoperable system to track all pharmaceutical packages must be in place by the year 2023. This review has highlighted many of the federal laws which have shaped the pharmacy profession and the healthcare system in which we practice. As the pharmacy profession and our society involve, more legislation will undoubtedly be enacted on a federal level. It is incumbent upon all of us that we keep abreast of legislative developments, advocate for positive changes to our profession, and look for ways that we can provide outstanding patient care while ensuring the safety and quality of our medications. What will you do to move the profession forward in the years ahead?